All right, welcome to We Are Libertarians Daily. I am your host, Hody Johns, and I am here with a big deal. I got Arvin Vora. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Great. Hey, I was I was actually saying, <laughs> we talked with my uh, girlfriend at the last convention. I said, we, we both said, you know, the most handsome guy in the liberty movement is bar none. It's Arvin Vora. <laughs> and we <laughs> even said, I wonder if he's even going to wear a suit for the interview. And he totally is. So if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast, Make sure to check out the YouTube at least briefly so that you can see who we're talking to here. But Arvin, thank you for uh, being so professional. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on here. I mean, this this setup is beautiful. I'm excited to talk about so many ideas in the liberty movement, so many ideas that we're seeing really changing the face, not just of the liberty movement, but of American culture. Yeah, you know, there's uh, there's been some argument and i use uh, a quote from you uh, very often i guess i probably don't quote you perfectly but that if this country were to dis- disassemble the entire government we have today mm-hmm. with the culture we have we would build the same one tomorrow and a, absolutely a, a col- politics really does reflect culture i guess since you're the maker mm-hmm. of that quote i'll let you dive deeper into that I think it's absolutely true. I mean, if we look at the worst parts of government, the ones that are the most expensive, the ones that do the most damage, they are also the part that are the most worshipped by this culture at this time. Talking about government schools, I'm talking about the military. Those two organizations cost the most and inflict the most harm, and they are the most heroized. And if we dismantle government schools today, if we shut down the military, you know, shut down all foreign bases, said we're only going to use the military for defense and nothing else. We're not going to have a standing army of 3 million people. We're going to just say what is the lowest cost way to defend America only, not Israel, not Saudi Arabia, not France. If we did that with a tiny army by the next day, people would clamor that we have this big giant military again and we get government schools back again because that's what they're used to. That's what they worship. That's what they see as righteous. And what we need to do, need to do as libertarians is we need to change that culture. We cannot be afraid of changing that culture. It's it's a scary thing to think about, I guess, when you say, well, it's fun to talk about these little changes as libertarianism. Yay, we got pot kind of, maybe not legalized, mm-hmm. but they don't prosecute it in the state anymore. Yay, mm-hmm. we take these little victories. But I, I think even for libertarians, it's almost scary to think about disassembling the whole system. There's a lot of libertarians mm-hmm. that still use the public schools. There's a lot of libertarians mm-hmm. that still call... You know, I, I think a lot of times it even comes like, don't call the police. And it's like, well, what if somebody breaks into my house? I'm not good with a gun. I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so so totally relate to you there. Now, you have a book that is rising on the ranks. It is out now. It uh, is, yeah. Yeah, it, it's called uh, Pull Out. Mm-hmm. Um, is there double entendre intended there? It is. You know, it started as a kind of a casual conversation between me and a few friends. Okay. I just read Lean In. I thought it was a great book. I was excited by the ideas. And I said, you know, here's somebody who's providing guidance for young women, most of the guidance, which I actually think is very good. I agree with most of the things in Lean In. But we don't see the same thing for young men. And I said, well, what should young men be doing right now? And in my opinion, young men today should be rejecting the institutions that have abandoned them. They should be fighting the welfare state that has disempowered them. They should stop fitting into these roles that make them essentially weak, second-class citizens in their own culture, in their own homes, in their own schools. And so I decided I would write a book that was providing that kind of guidance for men. Are there heavy anarchistic themes in it? I mean, obviously. I don't, I don't think I can write about anything without bringing some of that up. But it doesn't stop there. It talks about a lot of ideas that I think are critical for young men to be thinking about now. Yeah, there's uh, I have felt that and, and it, a lot of people think of feminism is just like like the um, oh, the hashtag movement, the uh, the, mo- um, the Me Too movement, Me Too movement. They, I don't sure. know. I was, I was like, me speak out, whatever movement. Yeah, Me Too movement. And a lot of people think of that as like feminism. But fem- I mean, the really the feminist movement has been going on for over 100 years. They've been constantly reevaluating their identity, constantly mm-hmm. talking about what they need to do and who they are. And I think men just need something of the same right now. And mm-hmm. I, I don't feel that, and maybe you would disagree or agree, I don't feel that the feminist movement, movement even can come at the expense of men. I don't think there's any reason we even need to say, well, they we've given up so many rights to them 
that's kind of who we were was overlording them. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, what what are your thoughts? I guess on that, like, would you agree, disagree? There, there's 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 a lot of things over there. I mean, the, the first thing is I do think it's important for us to give credit where credit's due. And to me, a lot of my inspiration comes from early feminists, people like Susan B. Anthony. You read her writings, and what she's saying is, what we want is to be able to have. I'm paraphrasing here, but to have our own property to not have somebody else take our property without consent. We want to be able to work and to keep the fruits of our labors. Now, these are all today ideas that many parts of third wave feminism seem to have rejected because they're saying, well, we don't want just that. We don't want property rights. We don't want to protect that. And so to me, property rights feminism, that's first wave feminism. And a lot of the ideas that we're talking about in the men's movement are very, very parallel. And there are things where I see something that's good being happen, happening for women and the obvious correlation is simply not happening for men. I do think it is good to teach young women about the dangers of date rape. I think that's just common sense. Yeah. But at the same time, I think it's important to teach young men about the importance of things like paternity testing. In many states today, if you haven't gotten a paternity test by the time, you're, by your, by the time your son or daughter is, is two or three years old, depending on the state, If you then find out that that has been basically a fraud done against you, you don't have any choice but to continue to pay child support for the for the remainder until the 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 child is eighteen. Those are type of things that most men are shocked about when they realize they're like, "Why didn't someone tech tell me? Why didn't a counselor tell me? Why didn't a doctor tell me? Why didn't any of these people who I'm supposed to be trusting to give me guidance? Why didn't they tell me?" And so a lot of the things I do and pull out is provide you know, do my best to provide that kind of guidance. Here are the things you have to think about. I'm sure well over half our audience, that's their first time even hearing that that's a thing, you know, that, that, mm-hmm. that you can, you can be, uh, exploited that way. You know, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to back up before I go forward that, sure. uh, about the feminist movement. I see it a lot as like the, uh, the civil rights movement and how much mm-hmm. gun rights were important to African Americans and how that yep. has changed within that community is surprising mm-hmm. to me. You look at, you know, the feminist movement and what changed for them and how all of a sudden it's kind of become like a, you know, Bernie Sanders esque, like, w- wait, yeah. what does this have to do with feminism? What does leftism have to do with feminism? They're and it does one and yeah. the same, you know, and I felt that libertarianism is such a natural, I mean, feminists founded our party. Feminists actually, we're kind of the early libertarians in the United States Civil War era. The fact the first electoral vote for a woman went to a libertarian. Wow. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so really, I mean, fe- feminism, I've always fe- felt was so libertarian. I mean, kind of like civil rights, you know, I felt we're so mm-hmm. libertarian. It's funny that we seem to have lost those within the party. Um, but again, I mean, I mean, to get off a party, you're talking about culture, you're talking about some important things. Mm-hmm. What, what are some, um, I guess, go further in the book. We talk, we talk about uh, the court system and, and pulling out of that. Sure. Uh, you want to talk about the military system pulling out of that? Sure. I, I mean, absolutely. I think a central idea in, in male culture since just the beginning of the human species has really been the idea of a rite of passage which is, you know, we, a boy does something and then that boy becomes a man. And if that boy does something that requires strength, we see a man as stronger than a boy. And if it requires, you know, cleverness, we see as a man is cleverer than a boy, et cetera, et cetera. And what I see is happening in American culture today is on one side, you have the military and on the other side, you have, you know, government subsidized colleges trying to usurp that role, saying that this is the new rite of passage. One rite of passage, you're going to sacrifice four years of your life and, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars on studying some nonsense. And, and then they'll dress you up in robes and say, yeah, now you've passed this rite of passage. And on the other side, you have the military where you're going to spend years of your life, a possibly physical injury, almost certainly psychological injury, and without question, moral damage to you at a fundamental level as a human. And they're going to, they're trying to usurp that. They're trying to fit into that. And military commercials will routinely just use that phrase. They'll say, you know, this is a rite of passage. And I say the simple fact is this, at no point in human history, except for this very recent time, has a man been seen as more obedient than a boy. That to me is a perversion of a rite of passage because that's what we're getting from colleges. That's what we're getting from the military. To me, I say, listen, see what you can do without, without either of those. What can you do 
to decide who you want to be? How can you shape a rite of passage that makes sense to you, that helps you define what's important to you, rather than how you can become more subservient either to academia or to the military industrial complex? So, so yeah, when it comes to pulling out of the military, I 100% support that. So one of those, uh, one of the tough things about libertarians, they talk about like herding cats a lot. And I think it's becoming kind of, uh, I can see it even with what you're saying, because people say, well, I'm an individual now. I don't need to be a part of collective. That included, that includes being with you guys, being with you guys. Is there any pull in? Is there any type of things that you think young men should be gravitating towards right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are quite a few things. And I think you really have to come down to this fundamental economic principle, which is this. If you have somebody, if you have two people, one person has two skills and the other person has just one skill, then that one person becomes dependent on that one skill. And in a, in a general biological sense, women can produce kids and they can also produce things of economic value. Men can only do the economic thing. Men, men at, at this point in science can't get pregnant. They can't produce kids. And so what that means to me is that anything that is geared towards socialism, anything that is geared towards welfareism, anything that takes away your economic right to say no, to say, no, I'm not giving this money to that person because that person hasn't done anything to earn it or I just don't want to. That economic right is so fundamental. And if you take that away, you disempower everybody to some extent, but you disempower men 100%. And so the first thing that any man should be doing, any young man should be doing, or any man of any age should be doing, is to find organizations that flat out oppose welfareism, that oppose government schools, that oppose traditional forms of welfare, that oppose Medicare and Medicaid. Those are the enemies of male power. Male power is economic power. You need to have the ability to say no, otherwise that power becomes meaningless. And, And so that's where you should as you put it, pull in. Sure. Get yourself economically uh, in a situation where you can be an individual and you don't have to depend on these these collectives. That makes sense. That too. But but to, to take it a little farther is, is to join any kind of a political organization, any party, any nonprofit, any whatever or for-profit thing that is there to shut down the welfare state. The welfare state and welfare socialism, those are the enemies of everyone to some extent, but of men 100%. Uh, you've called it the military welfare complex before. Did have, you make yes. that up, or did you get that from somebody else? I I don't I don't know of anybody else who said it, but I'm, I imagine that I'm not the first person to put together that what we have now is a giant welfare jobs program. It, you know, the military has become a place to take to take young men largely, and also some young women who are just kind of confused, don't really know what have direction in their life, and to just misdirect them into the worst possible choice that exists. And the motivations are often, you know, here's a job that's unnecessary to do that we're going to pay for, we're going to pay your college for, all that kind of stuff. And people start to think it's okay, or even in some culture, in some parts of the country, like, you know, like a great and heroic thing to do. To me, welfare is welfare. If you are being paid with tax money for a made up job that no one needs to do, even if it's hard, it's still welfare or maybe workfare but it's not legitimate earnings. It is not a legitimate enterprise. All right. So, so that's, uh, again, I, I do want to say, pull out Arvind Vora. It's in stores. You should absolutely give it a read. I plan on doing it. I admit that I have not. I, I'm, I'm finishing up Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell right now on my it's Audible. Right there. It's an awesome one. It's an awesome one. But that's, uh, that is my next book. And I'm um, you know, hoping to hear your great voice read it on Audible one day, but for now I'm going to get it on the the uh, Kindle there. So moving on, let's talk about um, let's talk about elections. You had mm-hmm. uh, you had some uh, provocative, but not really controversial, I guess, things to say about the mm-hmm. uh, the last election and and w- what direction you think you should go. So if you want to uh, summarize that sure. for our uh, audience, there there is a debate going on. It's been going on, and in my opinion, the twenty the twenty eighteen elections to me, have scientifically settled that debate for good, or at least for the next many, many years. And the question is, should we try to be nice? Should we be you know, inoffensive to soccer moms? Should we be playing this kind of you know, like harmlessness politics? Or should we be incendiary? Should we be going after the, cow, the sacred cows of the state? Which one should we be doing? 
And, you know, largely in response to a lot of things that I said, people said, well, we need to be inoffensive and harmless and not make waves and, you know, be super nice. And we had some campaigns that did that. They were super nice. They raised tons of money. They were very organized. They were great. And, and I'm not trying to denigrate anything that they were doing. I mean, what they were doing on that side was incredible. But the end result is this. They didn't change any ideas. And despite all the effort and money and energy poured into those campaigns, all that you have so far is some people saying, yeah, I guess libertarians are kind of okay. Not let's get rid of government schools. Not let's demolish the welfare state. Not let's use jury nullification to get rid of the drug war. Not let's switch over to Bitcoin. And so we can prevent the state from having money. We want that state to run out of money and shut down. Those ideas, which could have been spread phenomenally by some of those highly organized campaigns, were just not spread at all because the campaigns were trying to be inoffensive. Uh, and, and to me, this was a scientific experiment. I didn't know for sure what would happen. I mean, I was kind of, I thought that would happen. I was kind of hoping that it wouldn't happen. But I think at this point, I can very clearly say from multiple campaigns, that's what happened. To me, what can we get out of a big high profile campaign? We can change culture. We can encourage people to get into jury duty and say not guilty because it's not a crime. And that's how we got, uh, that's, that's the, the foundation, by the way, of how we got freedom of press in America. We can encourage people to say, government schools are welfare, I'm not going to use them. And if somebody else uses them, I'm going to insult them for it. Because sometimes if someone's doing something heinous and wrong, for example, just as we insult racists today, I want to see an era where we insult welfareists just as much and shut that down at a cultural level. Note that today there's no laws against racism. You can be as racist as you want to, but the cultural pressure has effectively shut down a huge percentage of it. Not all, but a lot. So those are the, that's some of the analysis that I had for the 2018 uh, campaigns. I believe in 2020, we should get bold. We should get brazen. We should make sure that people are so mad that they can't help but telling everybody else our ideas because they're so mad about them. Sure. Now, uh, when we talk about like making fun of people on like welfare, right, or, or uh, welfareists, sorry, not just the people on welfare, the welfareists, mm-hmm. that that a lot of times, you know, I, I don't think necessarily these campaigns were trying to be inoffensive. I think they were trying to win and trying to garner as many votes as they can, and sometimes that means pandering. At least that's what they thought. Now, we'll mm-hmm. note, and you note, they did not win anyway, so mm-hmm. you might as well have said what you really meant. Mm-hmm. But do you think there's a line then to say, well? I'm going to give you an example. There's been less legislation passed about um, police welfare reform since the kneeling. And I think a lot of that has come because not that people, not that everybody hates his message, but I think a certain group that would unify with the Colin Kaepernick kneeling all of a sudden became very angry and became hurt by it. Do you think that we can do damage to our cause then by saying incendiary things, by not being nice to these groups that maybe might be on our cause that just haven't thought it through yet. I think that you need to put things in a logical order, right? Okay. And we need to say who is going to most immediately benefit from shutting down all welfare. The people who are going to be the most immediate beneficiaries are going to be the people who I believe, (laughs) I mean, they're the ones who are going to respond. It's true that in the long run, everyone will benefit from the end of government schools. But in the short run, people who are not using government schools are going to benefit the most. They're not going to have any disruption. They're not going to have, they're not going to have to deal with those things. You can argue, yeah, the, the, long, the people who are stuck in government schools will no longer be, will no longer be harmed by the, the lack of quality education. And that's true, but that's not how they see it. They see it as, as a threat. So to me, I want to see who is benefiting right now. And I want to let them know that we're going to fight for, alongside them. I want homeschoolers to know that what they're doing is morally righteous, what the other side is doing is morally wrong, and that we're going to do everything we can to not have them have to pay for a bad, immoral service that they're not using anyway. Sure. You know, I, I think if anybody knows you, Arvin, I think they, they will probably think a little, a, a little like how I, I guess I used to think about, about you, and I will admit, and I will say this guy is probably the coolest person to talk to in person and the worst person to read online. <laughs> like, 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 all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, so I, I talked to Arvin before I heard his interview. I loved everything they said about him. Every time you, you've actually appeared on We're Libertarians before at the convention. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you know, you, uh, Johnny Rocket, uh, the launch mm-hmm. pad there. 
you know, and, and, and everybody's like, man, I love everything he said. This guy is so awesome. And then, uh, and then people look online and they're like, wait a minute, sex with 14 year olds, throwing police out of helicopters, shooting up school boards. What's going on? Are you just trying to reach different audiences? Why, why, why is the Arvin Vora in person so much nicer than the Arvin Vora on online? I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a question of audience, right? So online, my goal is to spread an idea by, you know, whatever mean is mo- means is most effective. Uh, the biggest example of this is when, when I started to see that military re- recruiting was happening inside of the LNC, when you have one LNC member bragging about joining the Marines after talking to another LNC member to get advice, to me, I'm like, okay, we have a problem here. Right. And so recognizing that it probably might sacrifice some of my my popularity, my goal was to get the entire party, you know, divided on this issue. Because before we had, you know, say 50% of people in favor of the military, 50% of the people silent. I don't know what the percentages are now, but I do know the anti-military people in the liberty movement, around the liberty movement, in the Libertarian Party, on pages like Anarchy Ball, etc., are no longer silent. And that to me is what was the goal, that I wanted people to know that if they spoke out against the military, that I was going to be speaking at least as loud as they would. (laughs) And I wanted them to see that you can set an entire party talking about one issue if you want, because when I run in 2020, I want the libertarian movement to understand this. We can make anything we want, not just the center of our discussion, but the center of American political discussion if we play our cards right. And so when I run, you know, when, if, if I get the nomination or even if I don't get the nomination while I'm running, I'm going to be trying to stir up the very issues that people are the most sensitive about. And I think that, that you know, things like the military are certainly about that. Um, you know, there are some, of, some of the things you mentioned were just, the, there was a, I mean, the, the school board thing, I mean, that was a, a stupid joke. I apologize for it immediately and, and dropped the topic. Uh, when it comes to things like age of consent, I don't think the government should be acting as a parent. And I think that when you say the government should act as a parent and it does it badly, then you need to get the government to stop acting as a parent. Some of the things I heard during that discussion were people saying, well, it's okay for 14 year olds to have sex with each other. And I'm like, that's idiotic. That is the result of letting the government make the decisions for you. Because you're right, the government does say it's okay for 14 year olds to have sex with each other. It's not. If you don't have a job, if you have no way of taking care of a kid, which are sometimes the consequence of having sex, then you have no business risking other people's money to pay for your welfare. And so th- that, you know, that's an example of something where it's been largely taken out of context and, and blown up into something other than what I intended to be. What I intended to be is government should not be making that decision because it does it poorly and it misleads people about what's right and wrong. Sure. Well, there's a logic. I mean, in that point specifically, and I don't really want to dwell on all that too much, but I think Mm -hmm. to that point specifically, there's definitely the logic there by saying like, well, you're ready to have sex, you know, and I say you're okay to have sex at 14 as long as it's with another 14 year old. But man, if you're having sex with an 18 year old, things start getting, you know, it's, it's, and I understand like the predatory nature that people are worried about, but if we're just talking about the act itself of having sex, it's like, Mm -hmm. well, either you're ready or you're not. And just because you had sex with somebody super immature is supposed to super mature that the logic really doesn't follow that it's like, yeah. oh, that's okay. You're both immature and stupid, so that's great, you know. It's <laughs> yeah, to... exactly. Yeah. What was, what was interesting was on a, I was on a punk rock libertarians discussing this issue, and and you know they were a little bit upset because they felt that I'd you know you know misrepresent the anarchist wing, and so I just asked. I mean, I was like, you know, have you ever been in a situation like that? And the host had to admit that his first time was he was 15, the girl was 19. By modern law, she was she was committing statutory rape. But he doesn't have any negative views of it. He, he thought it was like, you know, a positive and great experience. So, I mean, even the people who get mad when they actually think about it are like, you know, will often say, well, yeah, I guess, you know, in, in my case, it was OK. And, you know, when my grandmother married my grandfather, that was OK. And when my great grand made that was OK. Just like now it's not OK because it offends people. That, that to me is like nonsense. I mean, I don't, if, if something if the truth offends you, then. I mean, sorry, I don't know what to say about that. The truth sometimes is going to offend you. Sure. Well, we got to go case by case. I think people think, I I know that when I think of it, the cases that pop into my head are those rapey 60-year-olds that, you know, get these 
six, six or seven year old girls, you know, alone and, you know, and that type of thing, because that's that's all I see in the media. But then, you know, you think about it and you're like, oh, well, you know, most people's I mean, almost everybody's first time is under 18. Uh, yeah. I am a nerd and a Mormon, and I'll admit both of those things. And so I, I unfortunately didn't get to enjoy any of those things. So I didn't have to worry about this whole subject. But, you know, let's move on. I I, I, I hate running low on time, especially with you, but your time is super valuable. Uh, so let's, let's just go to your plans for the presidency. I'm going to preface the whole thing with one question that's going to be like the most genuine question I've ever asked anybody, because okay. I really am on the fence about the presidency in 2020. Okay. I've I've seen the hats in the ring. Um Benjamin, I just heard Kim on the Johnny Rocket. Um I'm I know that there's gonna be more that mm -hmm. are throwing their hats into the ring. I'm undecided. I think you're mm -hmm. the biggest risk I would ever take as a libertarian mm -hmm. because I say I am either going to be sitting around the Thanksgiving table and they'll be like, Man, that Arvin Vora's ideas are great or why the heck does – should we kill police officers, Hody? Is that what you're saying we should do? And I'm going to be like, no. That's like – so I'm like on the, the board, cusp, of, cusp of being like I get to say everything I want and just be a true libertarian or am I going to be defending something crappy for the rest of the the year with an Arvind Vora presidency? What would you say to people like me on the fence? I would say understand a couple things. First, look at my actual major media interviews. And you'll notice that when I'm on major media, I'll do two things. One, I'm actually reasonably civil. Two, you can't get me through a sentence without me talking about cutting some major part of government. If somebody talks about, you know, some minor uprising in some small part of the world, I'm talking about leaving NATO, cutting taxes, bringing U.S. troops home, laying them off, getting rid of those, that huge tax burden and letting the rest of the world fend, fend for itself you know, in, in one second. So, I mean, that's how I am when it comes to major media. And there, I mean, there's tons of, of major media that you can just look on YouTube and see what I'm like. And that's, that's what you'll see from me on major media. Okay. You know, people ask, is, are there things that are going to be incendiary? Yes, of course they're going to be incendiary. I am going to tell people that when they're in a jury, if it is a non-crime, any drug related thing, they should be saying not guilty. A lot of people don't know they can do that. That's how we got freedom of press. That's how we're going to nullify the drug war, in my opinion. Am I going to be talking about don't join the military? Yes, because the military right now is doing is, is problematic. It's not doing anything good. If they change what the military does, they'll say, yeah, maybe it's not so bad now. But right now, based on what this military is doing right now, do not join it. It is only doing negative things. Its preponderance is so negative that the one or two things that it accidentally does that might be considered positive are not worth the risk. Am I going to be saying things like end welfare and abolish government schools? Of course I am. That is what we're supposed to be talking about. I mean, these are the central issues that we're going to be focusing on. My number one goal is to get libertarians to stop being afraid of the big, huge, expensive, important issues to actually fight this cultural war. We have to stop acting like conservatives who just want to like hold the line while the left sits there and attacks and attacks and attacks and keep pushing it. We need to push that line as hard as the left does. We need to talk about ending all welfare the second they talk about, you know, you know government funded birth control or whatever the latest buzzword that they have. That's what we need to do. So I'm going to fight a forward moving, non-defensive, hyper aggressive campaign. I'm going after the sacred cows every chance that I get. That's what an Arvind Bora candidacy is going to look like. Whew. I think there's not much to add on that. Now, uh, we, we end with final thoughts. Um, sure. You know, so for me, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Arvind Vora has been uh, the biggest splash guy that libertarians have had for a while. And, uh, you know, check out his book. I'm going to check it out, too. I'd, I'd love to say that I've read it already. Have not, but planning to. So uh, check it out. Learn what he's about. Learn about all, you know, your libertarian presidential, uh, everybody who's throwing their hats in the ring and, and give it a good, honest look. Uh, I know for me, if this is the if this is the first time you've heard from him, that's awesome. If it's the second or third time and you're scared, you know, don't be scared <laughs> and, and ask him. You know, uh, uh, like I said, I was one of those guys that really didn't like uh, Arvin maybe about, you know, one or two years ago. And today I'm just like, man, I think he might be the best presidential candidate we have. So, like, really just just let your fears go. Let your logic rule. Um, and I'll turn the rest of the time over to you, Arvin. What do you, what do you got going on? You know, I've, I'm doing my best to get these ideas out there. I think we need a coalition of the people who will benefit right now from a cut in government, homeschoolers, young men or, or men of any age who are getting economically disenfranchised, women who don't use government schools, 
people of any gender that are not working who or who are working government jobs or who and want to leave or who are just not working government jobs. We want to re-enable and re-establish the free market. I see a country where our education system looks like our tech sector. I see a country where people, when they're looking to decide whether to join a gang or start a business, say that, look, starting a business is easier. There's not right, these stupid regulations anymore. I see so much amazing potential in the American people, but we need to go after government. Government is the enemy. If we can get it out of our way, we can have greatness in this country like we've never before seen. Awesome. Arvin, thank you so much. We look forward to uh, seeing you on the trails and uh, hearing from you again. And best of luck with everything you got going on. Thanks for having me on.